Friday, monsters. Thanks for joining us for another episode of the Murder, Murder News podcast, which also serves as a weekly meeting of our very own true crime cult. But not to worry, you've landed in the cult with all of the sing-alongs and none of the sarin gas. We just like to cuddle up to baby goats and exchange tales of murder and mayhem with our friends. If you're just finding us today, allow us to introduce ourselves, your charismatic leaders. I'm Angelina, and I'm here with my sinister sister, Aurora. How are you doing? How are things in Budapest? Uh, well, just hanging on for dear hanging life. <laughs> things, are, things are going. Things are, you know, choppy, but mm-hmm. survivable. Well, that's that's positive, I suppose. <laughs> that's, that's, you got to look for the silver lining. I will probably survive. <laughs> do I want to? I don't know. Mm, that's but... another question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't necessarily see another option. So Aww. here we are. Here's to things hopefully looking up. Yes. And yeah. I hope that y'all are having a better week. If you have something good going on in your lives right now, why don't you send us a message at murdermurdernews at gmail.com because honestly, we're both having like an awful no good week and could yeah. use words of encouragement. <laughs> And if you've got nothing good going on, but you do have adorable animals that you share your home with, then send us photos. We we need that. God, we would love to see your pets. <laughs> <laughs> so just by tuning into our show, you've earned a spot in our hearts as honorary monsters. But if you'd like to make it official and join the MMN commune for real, you want to join us on Patreon. You can find us on patreon.com slash murder, murder news. And there you can pledge any amount you can spare to show your support for all that we do. And in return, we'll send you some murder merch, give you a shout out on the show. You'll also get a baby goat named in your honor. And Mm -hmm. of course, Mm -hmm. you'll have exclusive access to our regular Patreon only content. We've just done an episode about the ins and outs of the insanity defense. So if you're curious to learn more details about that area of the law, then be sure to sign up as a patron and check out that video. Before we dig in, let's take a look at some of the true crime stories that have been making headlines this week. At least eight people, including two police officers, were attacked in a shooting that took place this last Tuesday night in Rex, Georgia. Clayton County Field Training Officer Henry Laxon was fatally shot. Two unidentified women and the suspected shooter also lost their lives in the gunfire. The 12-year-old boy was left in critical condition. Officer Alex Chandler is expected to recover. Authorities were initially called to investigate some type of disturbance at the residence near the intersection of Macon Highway and Interstate 675. They met the 12-year-old boy who had been shot in the face in the front yard. Despite his serious injuries, the boy was able to lead police to the residence. There is currently no further information available about other victims or suspects of the shooting. The info will be released after the next of kin have been notified. An incredible and terrible story surrounding the details of a memoir written by Lovely Bones author Alice Siebold made headlines this week as a case that was once thought to be closed was re-examined. Siebold's memoir, titled Lucky, was in the process of being adapted to film, with Yu's Victoria Pedretti set to star. Lucky was about a rape that Siebold endured while walking alone through a tunnel when she was 18 years old. Months later, she passed a man walking on the street and called police to report that she recognized him as her attacker. Anthony Broadwater was subsequently charged and spent 16 years in prison. Executive producer Timothy Muccianti noticed some discrepancies between the manuscript and the film script and hired a private investigator to re-examine the case. It turned out that Broadwater had been wrongfully convicted using microscopic hair analysis, which is now regarded as junk science. He had been wrongly identified by Siebold in one of those sad situations where some folks have a hard time telling people apart across racial lines, Mm. as Broadwater is a black man. Broadwater has now been exonerated, and the director, producer, and actress Victoria Pedretti have pulled out of the film project. Lucky's publisher will cease distribution of all formats of the memoir while they work with the writer to consider how the book might be revised. Siebold has said she's, quote, deeply sorry, but I think she can do better than that. Yeah, this is really upsetting. I kind of like was watching yeah. this this uh, situation unfold this week. Like I saw an article pop up in my feed about Victoria Pedretti. Is that her name? 
from yeah, you yeah. Um, that she had pulled out of the film. And then I was reading about the producer that had kind of, you know, questioned it and thought thing. maybe yeah, this yeah. isn't what we think it is. And mm-hmm. um, and then Alice's apology came a little bit after that. And mm-hmm. wow, like how freaking upsetting. I just feel like she's a wealthy lady from Lovely Bones and who knows how much money mm-hmm. she made from her memoir about wrongly naming mm-hmm. this man. Like, I feel like she can do better than an apology. Like he's, he's lost yeah. his life because of her, yeah. you know, wrong idea about this. Right. And her um, memoir, Lucky, predated the Lovely Bones. But um, I don't think she would have met with such success after, you know, if that was her first novel, if she didn't have a history of having written, you know, interesting works. And uh, I think even though the Lovely Bones is a different story, um, the fact that she's become so obviously wealthy from that and, uh, you know, lived a comfortable life while this person that she wrongly accused has spent his life behind bars. Um, she should be making up for that financially and and then some. It's really terrible. And I, of course, feel mm. for her the fact that she is a survivor of rape. Like, it's just terrible. Right. But I, I just can't imagine if I wrongly like identified my rapist yeah. and then had Especially so much. Especially a black man because yes. you're like, he looks like that black guy. Like, no, that's oof. Very oof. It's it's really cringy, and I yeah. do hope that she does more for him, and mm-hmm. you know helps make sure that he has a comfy life now that he's out of yeah. prison for something he didn't do. Yeah, yeah, that's really sad all around. But I'm glad that it was caught before the film was made because that would have been a bigger mess. Yeah, like if she profited more off of, um, mm-hmm. you know, like and, and like certainly like she deserves to be able to profit from like the bad thing that happened from her. Like the fact that she's right. had so much success from that is great. But like she needs to take care of him. Like <laughs> yeah, and that story, like if it was, um, if it came out on film and you know was a uh, popular, continued to drag his name through the mud. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It just solidifies his bad reputation. And he talked about having, um, you know, fallen out with his family members. He had a bad reputation with even people that he had known well before all of this. Um, so she, you know, his life was ruined. So she, yeah, it's it's ruined his life. Yeah. So sad. Terrible. Now, before we get into our story, we just want to say that while our tone is light in the intro, we do take the topics we're discussing very seriously. We are best buds and we love chatting together every week and turning it into a podcast. We want to share that passion with you and to create a vibe where all of you feel like our best buds too. We joke about us friends forming a cult or commune, but that's not to diminish the severity of actual cult activity, which we do occasionally talk about in our weekly stories. We feel it's important to open up and talk about even the darkest aspects of humanity and the downright scary things that come up in the news. But we want to make it clear that our intention is never to sensationalize, and we always try to deliver these stories with respect to all parties involved or affected by the crimes we discuss. We always post our sources in the episode description so you can do some digging on your own if a story we present piques your interest. But you should know that if you ever feel we get it wrong, either in our tone or in the details of the case, we want to hear about it. We are more than happy to make a correction or give an update on a case we've discussed in previous episodes. So feel free to reach out to us at murdermurdernews at gmail.com. Some specific trigger warnings for this episode include strangulation, abuse of corpses, sexual assault, child sexual abuse, and necrophilia. So if any of those subjects are particularly sensitive for you, you may want to skip this one and listen to one of our other episodes instead. One year ago today, UK police uncovered the tip of one very disturbing iceberg, the full extent of which may never be known. Authorities were led to the apartment of David Fuller after a new analysis of decades-old DNA evidence connected him to the unsolved bedsit murders. As a side note, for those of you who aren't British, a bedsit seems to be a type of apartment like a studio. Both murders involved young women who lived alone in bedsit apartments. On June 22, 1987, 25-year-old Wendy Nell spent the evening with her boyfriend, Ian Plass, and then he drove her home on his motorcycle around 11 p.m. The couple said goodnight at a reasonable hour because they both had work the next morning. 
The next morning, Wendy didn't show up for work at Super Snaps, which was a shop that developed color photos. The manager called Wendy's mom, who in turn called Ian to ask him to check in on her. Ian Plass showed up at Wendy's apartment, which was on Guildford Road in Tunbridge Wells in England. He didn't have a key to her place, and of course there was no answer at the door, so he went around to the back and climbed through a window, which seemed a bit too easy. Wendy had been battered and strangled to death. Then, either in the moments surrounding her death or possibly after her death, she had been sexually assaulted. Ian found his girlfriend dead in her bed and sat there stroking her hair for a while, and he then opened her eyelids and lifted her arm. Quote, I couldn't believe she was gone, he said in a statement that was eventually submitted to the court during Wendy's murder trial. Unfortunately, Ian couldn't testify himself because he died before her killer was ever found. So did Wendy's father. And the rest of the family was pretty upset that he would never get to see justice come through for Wendy. 33 years went by, and Wendy's case had long gone cold. Carolyn Pierce was 20 years old in 1987, and she lived in Tunbridge Wells. She worked at a restaurant called Buster Brown's, and she didn't show up for work on November 25th, though a taxi had dropped her off at home the night before. Witnesses had heard screams coming from Carolyn's doorstep on the night she disappeared, and she was missing for three weeks before her body was found. Carolyn's body, naked except for a pair of tights, had been dumped in a field in St. Mary's in the marsh about 40 miles away from her home. Carolyn had been beaten and strangled to death, and she had been sexually assaulted. Her body was found by a tractor driver. Carolyn's father had also died before he could find closure about his daughter's murder. Around the time the murders took place, there had been reports of prowler activity and a peeping Tom looking through women's windows. Aside from the similar manner of their deaths and the fact that they lived in the same neighborhood and both lived in bedsits, both women's key rings were missing with the keys to their apartments. Police started drawing lines to connect the two murders immediately, but there weren't any solid suspects. Again, this was the 80s. There was no security footage or doorbell cams, no cell phones to ping, and DNA analysis was in its early infancy. The National Database of Offender Profiles wasn't created until eight years after the murders. So while some evidence was collected, it wasn't of much help at the time. DNA was collected from a towel, a pillowcase, and a duvet in Wendy's home. A fingerprint was found on a plastic bag near her bed. There was also a distinctive shoe print from a Clark's Sportech running shoe on a blouse on the floor of Wendy's apartment. The very same shoe print was found near where Carolyn's body was found. In 1999, they scanned the new database and came up with nothing. In 2019, there was a brand new forensic technique that made it possible to collect a damaged sperm sample from Carolyn's tights. Then, using familial DNA, they finally found a new lead. Initially, it was Fuller's brother's DNA that was found to be a partial match to DNA found at the crime scenes. Working through the family tree, they found David Fuller, who was a billion to one match, which means he's a billion times more likely to be uh, responsible for these crimes than uh, any other person. <laughs> Sounds promising. Uh-huh. So police showed up at David Fuller's East Essex apartment in the early hours of December 3rd, 2020. There's a police body cam video from Fuller's arrest that is very British. (laughs) A meek-looking, balding man with a gray comb over and large glasses opened the door saying, yes, good morning, and then looks up to see officers on his front stoop and says, oh, blimey. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) The police let David know that he had been forensically and geographically linked to two murders that took place in 1987. They said they had to bring him in so that they could collect samples from him and have him in custody so he didn't flee while they further investigated Fuller's connection to the crimes. They brought the then 66-year-old man in for questioning, where at first he denied knowing the victims or where they lived, and he claimed he didn't know the Tunbridge Wells area very well. However, through further questioning and investigation and by piecing together documents from Fuller's home, it was determined that he knew the area quite well. David Fuller had actually lived on the Guilford Road, the same street as Wendy, in the early 1980s. He had a good friend at the time who he would frequently visit on Grosvenor Park, where Carolyn lived. In his work as an electrician, he had jobs all over Tunbridge Wells over the years, several very close to the victim's apartments. 
Carolyn Pierce's body was discovered nearby to where Fuller's grandparents had lived, who he often visited as a child. He also belonged to a cycling club, and one of their regular cycling routes went right past the location where Carolyn was found. Fuller had also vacationed in the area in the 1980s. Fuller was also found to have frequented Buster Brown's restaurant in Tunbridge Wells, where Carolyn worked. And he was an amateur photographer who often dropped into Wendy's work, Super Snaps, to have film processed. In fact, many photos were found in David's apartment still in their Super Snaps sleeves. Fuller considered himself to be the unofficial photographer of his favorite band, The Cutting Crew, who he often followed around taking photos while they were on tour. His favorite song was, ironically, Died in Your Arms. What the hell? (laughs) Yeah, creepy. While he was in custody, David Fuller was fingerprinted and his prints were found to match the one on the plastic bag found near Wendy's bed. In his apartment, they also found photos from the 80s showing Fuller wearing sports trek running shoes that matched the footprints found at both crime scenes. After this point, David Fuller pretty readily admitted that he had, in fact, killed both women. Here's a long quote from the senior investigating officer, Detective Superintendent Ivan Beasley, which was on the Kent police website. Wendy Nell and Carolyn Pierce had their whole lives ahead of them before they were both brutally murdered more than 30 years ago. We've always refused to accept that their killer would escape justice and knew it was only a matter of time before enhancements and DNA profiling would provide us with the answers to track down a suspect. The evidence we have now been able to present has proved without a shred of doubt that David Fuller carried out these appalling and depraved crimes. The families of these two young women have endured immeasurable horror, pain, and utter despair caused by a man who has shown little, if any, capacity for remorse or sorrow. I would like to pay tribute to all of Wendy and Caroline's loved ones and friends who have assisted us over the years with what has always been a particularly harrowing case for everyone involved. I do hope that they are now able to take some comfort after so many years of uncertainty and frustration. It saddens me that we were not able to identify and bring Fuller to justice sooner, particularly for Bill Nell, Wendy's father, who is no longer with us. Finally, I would like to recognize the efforts of every single Kent police officer and member of staff who has worked on this case since 1987. So it's certainly nice to see the surviving family members of the victims finally get closure after all those years. But wait, there's more. While David Fuller was in police custody, officers continued to search his apartment. They unexpectedly uncovered a trove of photos and video clips dating back to 2008. There were 4 million images depicting sexual abuse, most of which were downloaded from the internet. This made up one of the biggest stashes of child pornography ever discovered by the police. Many images and videos taken by Fuller himself showed him sexually abusing the corpses of at least 100 women and girls. He had filmed himself having sex with dead bodies, including children. His victims ranged in age from nine years to 100 years old. Police found four hard drives with a combined five terabytes of data attached to the back of a cupboard. There was a total of 100 hard drives, 2,200 floppy disks, 30 SIM cards and mobile phones, 1,300 CDs and DVDs, 34,000 photo prints, negatives, slides, and camera rolls, and 3,500 digital storage devices. These corpses were abused in hospital mortuaries at two hospitals where Fuller had worked as an electrician. The Kent and Sussex Hospital, where Fuller worked beginning in early 1989, and the Tunbridge Wells Hospital, which he moved to in 2010. Fuller was not a loner during this time. He had actually had three wives in total and a few children. His family was incredulous that the man they knew could not have done something like this, having had no inclination that Fuller had ever committed anything beyond marital infidelity, which he was pretty renowned for. Unfortunately, his wives had no idea of the scope of that infidelity. Fuller's family was notified of the murder charges, but hadn't been informed about the necrophilia. They were surprised and appalled to learn of Fuller's despicable crimes during the trial. David Fuller initially tried to plead diminished responsibility, which is a leaf of the insanity defense that we explored pretty thoroughly on our November Patreon exclusive. So if you're not too familiar with all that surrounds the insanity defense, 
you'll want to check that out for a little more background information. Prosecutor Duncan Atkinson spoke of the photo and video material that was found in Fuller's flat. It shows the defendant to derive sexual gratification from sexual activity with those who have died, he said. He added, it therefore provides a reason for the killings, however deviant and repellent, that does not depend on an explanation of mental illness that deprived the defendant of his self-control. The prosecutor noted that Fuller had no history of mental health problems until 2010, when he had reported depressed feelings stemming from chronic pain in his legs, which seems a little unlikely to lead a person down the path to murder and necrophilia. Mm, No. (laughs) No. (laughs) And with that, Fuller changed his plea to guilty mid-trial. He pled guilty to two counts of murder and sexual assault, plus 51 other offenses, including 44 charges related to 78 unidentified victims. It's difficult to know the full scope of Fuller's crimes because many probably preceded easily accessible handheld photo and video technology. Police set up a phone line to assist them in identifying potential victims dating back to the 1980s. And after receiving over 400 phone calls, authorities have listed at least 100 victims and are continuing to count to this day. David Fuller did admit to searching out his deceased victims on Facebook after assaulting them. And he even kept a little black book with dozens of his victims, names and details about them. Fuller began working in the hospital system back in 1989, and despite never working in the mortuary or medical field, he had keycard access to all areas of the hospital in which he was employed as an electrician. Health Secretary Sajid Javid asked the health sector to make some major modifications following the case. Quote, First, the NHS has written to all trusts asking for mortuary access and postmortem activities to be reviewed against current guidance. Second, an independently chaired review is already underway into exactly what occurred at the trust, which will report into me. Finally, I have asked the Human Tissue Authority for advice on whether changes are required to our existing regulations, end quote. NHS trusts have been asked to urgently review their practices with regards to effective CCTV coverage, all access and entry points controlled by swipe access, risk assessment, and appropriate DBS check application. So just making the hospitals a lot more secure and giving people like electricians less access to things like the mortuary. Yeah, right. An independent review of the trust where Fuller worked is underway, but MPs are calling for a wider national review. Tunbridge Wells MP Greg Clark said NHS probing carried out so far was insufficient, adding, quote, To be clear, this is without precedent. There's never been a case in Britain in which the number and scale of abuse of dead bodies has been revealed in this way. The questions that are raised include local ones about how this was allowed to happen. But there are also national ones as to whether national policy was good enough, was stringent enough, and whether it could have happened in other hospitals across the country. He said the lack of CCTV in postmortem rooms was a concern, adding, we do not know how many people Fuller assaulted and how many people there are like Fuller across the country. We need to work on the assumption that there may be others and we need to protect people from being preyed on. The government may even rethink standard sentencing following this case for crimes like necrophilia, which currently carries a maximum two-year prison sentence in the UK. In our aforementioned Patreon exclusive, we also explored a number of landmark cases that ushered in necessary modifications to the law just like this one. So if you find that sort of thing interesting, we explore plenty of milestones in that video as well. Authorities also continue to work to this day to connect Fuller to additional murders from his past. Though David Fuller was arrested one year ago today, both his trial and the investigation into his past are still very much ongoing. Just this month, Fuller was identified as a possible suspect in the so-called Cinderella murder. In 1986, 24-year-old barmaid Linda Cook was murdered, her body dumped in Portsmouth Wasteland, just a mile from where David Fuller grew up. The case was dubbed the Cinderella murder because of the distinctive shoe print found on the scene. The footprint was actually left on Linda's body, and it bore the word flash. A man named Michael Shirley 
then just 18 years old, was wrongfully convicted of Miss Cook's murder and spent 15 years in prison before being cleared through DNA evidence in 2003. We're hoping that as the investigation and the trial unfold, more of Fuller's crimes will come to light and that he is eventually sentenced to reflect the heinous nature of his crimes and the sheer number of victims that he has assaulted. Wow, it does feel like, you know, sometimes you just get like a sense of somebody's crimes Mm. that like two doesn't sound like the right number. Like it seems like he had an MO and like he knew what he was doing. And um, and obviously like the uh, child porn Mm -hmm. and the necrophilian hospitals is extremely upsetting. Mm -hmm. But I would be shocked if there were no more murders associated with him because it seems, it feels very serial killer street to me. Absolutely. And I think it's so unlikely that a person would uh, commit a couple of murders in the late 80s and then just stop while not being caught and just to, you know, decide not to murder any more people that it was fine already dealing with the the people that were right. already dead. That I don't think that's uh, how he operated either. I think uh, we will, it sounds like the Cinderella murder was definitely connected to him. And uh, I think we'll be hearing right. about even more murders. Yeah. Interesting, sad case. Yeah. I started watching some crimey things again. Great. I've been watching The Innocent Man. Um, Have you heard about it? Um, No, I haven't. Tell me about it. I haven't heard of this yet. So the series is um, sort of based on a book by John Grisham, who is normally like a crime fiction writer. Um, So Grisham is interviewed heavily in the series as well. He explained that, um, well, he wrote 40 books altogether, And this was his 20th book. Uh, It was his only nonfiction book. So every other one is a a fictional crime story. But this one, this this real story drew so much attention from him that he just had to write a book about it. Interesting. And so uh, basically what it is, is there uh, were some crimes going on in Oklahoma, which were sealed up pretty, um, quote unquote, easily with uh, some pretty damning uh, confession tapes. And um, it seems like these tapes were all coerced. It's like the um, the police found people who were just kind of losers in society. Uh, some of them were like uh, drug addicts or maybe had like a, a bit of a mental health issue or were heavy drinkers. And they just figured that they could uh, pin these crimes on those people and make them go away. Right. Those people are all, um, you know, still in, in prison, a lot of them. And, and, you know, some came very close to being executed wrongfully. So wow. um, it's just... That's messed up. There's, some, there's interviews with their family members, with friends. There's clips from their confession tapes, including clips that seem very um, pushy. And uh, it just, it's very wrong, but fascinating. Wow. That sounds really interesting. I'll definitely have to check that out. And whenever I hear John Grisham, I always think of um, the Hugh Grant movie where he owns a bookshop, uh, Notting Hill. Oh, God. <laughs> this is like such a funny, like, I don't know why this has always been in my head, but like in the movie he owns, I think he just owns a, uh, like a travel book, bookstore. Okay. And I think that's the only thing he carries mm-hmm. Like if memory serves, mm-hmm. or maybe people are like coming in to ask for that in the bookstore or something else, whatever it is, it's like a theme bookstore. And so like the joke is like, there's always people coming in to ask if they have other books. And he's like, no, no, it's like, we no, carry one kind no of book. John Grisham and it's here. <laughs> yeah. And so like a guy comes in and he's like, do you have John Grisham's latest thriller? And he's like, no, no. <laughs> Whenever I hear that, I always think of the man saying That's that. So and it's funny. so funny to me. Oh my God. <laughs> Super random. I think of my mom. I think my mom read a bunch of John Grisham, which um, is cool. That's my mom's cooler uh, book options, I guess, <laughs> that she chose. Oh, nice. Usually it's like gross romance novels and then John Grisham. I've probably read some <laughs> John Grisham books in my time. <laughs> I can't think of one, but probably. <laughs> yeah, actually, Grisham said in this show, he was like, the reason that I had to write this as a true story. He was like, uh, if I wrote it as a fictional story, people wouldn't believe it. It was just too unbelievable. So that's, that's really something. Amazing. So what about you? What have you been watching? Uh, nothing, um, super too crimey, except I've been watching Murdered and Missing in Montana. Um, I did watch that this past weekend, which is really wonderful. It looks 
into the major situation we have um, that I'm sure if you're into true crime and if you're listening to our podcast, you're already pretty aware of, but with missing Indigenous women mm-hmm. in the United States and in Canada, and it specifically looks into cases in Montana mm-hmm. and the U.S. And um, the statistics are pretty like shocking in it. You know, like it's it's wild to hear that. Um, I believe that the U.S. population for Indigenous people is uh, pretty low. It's 2% but indigenous women make up for 40% of women trafficked in the U.S. Yeah, that is- Which is just shocking. That is very astounding. Yeah, and like the murder rate is 10 times higher than that of the average murder rate Mm. for women, for indigenous women. So it's just really upsetting. Mm -hmm. And the show looks into three cases of specific teenage girls that were missing and then found dead in very mysterious circumstances. And, um, And it's like, the police are like, they dropped dead. Oh, yeah. That and happens. it's like, yeah, like that happens all the time. Mm-hmm. Teenage girls are walking by the side of the road with very low to no blood alcohol levels and just like They just die. drop dead. Like yeah, all the time. That happens, sure. It's really messed up yeah. and their families are fighting for answers um, to what might have happened to try to get justice. And uh, it's really sad. Yeah. So definitely go check that out. Yeah. Like if you would like to feel sad, yeah. which I do sometimes <laughs> like that. Sometimes Angry. it's nice to feel sad about something uh, a little more yeah. removed from you <laughs> to find a place to put all your sad feelings, I guess. Yeah. But that those are some very incredible statistics. And I would think, you know, you would think after learning about and confirming those kinds of statistics that, um, you know, maybe police would lend an extra eye to... Um, cases involving Indigenous women, maybe they would take it extra seriously and, you know, put a, an inquiry into that or, you know, take, you know, just as soon as a, an Indigenous woman is reported missing, that they would take it to be, you know, a, a part of this whole thing. But they seem to do quite the opposite. They, like, the pattern is there and yeah. they just don't care. It doesn't affect how they treat it's things. It's really upsetting. Mm-hmm. Like, and in these particular cases, because of the girls' ages, uh, it should have been, they're missing cases should have been reported to the FBI. Mm-hmm. And so all they had to do was not even investigate yeah. it, just put it just into the computer and let the FBI take over. Mm-hmm. And they did not, mm-hmm. they did not. They, like in one of the cases, I think it took them 20 days to report the girl missing. And like the next day they found her body. So like it didn't help anyone. Wow. And like, it's just, it's just really, you know, like they just were not taking it seriously mm-hmm. and it's so messed up and it's so obvious what was going on there. And oh my God, very upsetting. Mm-hmm. So definitely go check out and support that show. It's on oxygen. So it's uh, quite easy to find. We also want to announce that um, we are going to be taking a little bit of a break, um, like probably all of you <laughs> for the holidays. So, um, you know, we need a little break too. We've been working really hard on this. So uh, hopefully uh, you have some episodes that you can dig into from our past, or maybe you haven't found us on Patreon yet and you can jump in there and still find plenty of cool content from us. But we won't have podcast episodes um, on Friday the 17th or on the 24th or the 31st. So that's our little holidays there. Yeah. Um, but keep an eye out for our show that will come out right after these holidays. So we'll be back for... We'll be back in January. Yeah. <laughs> January 7th. We do have a show next week and we have a show January 7th. And in between... Um, I mean, you can check us out everywhere else. We got lots of stuff for you. Yeah, we'll still be on social media. You can still come hang out with us. Yeah, we're still down to hang out. You know, have some holiday cheer. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> well, I guess that's enough murder for one week. If you disagree and would actually prefer just a little bit more murder, you can always find us on the OG murdermurder.news for the latest breaking true crime news every day of the week. You can find us on Instagram at Murder Murder News, where we have and will continue to post some cute puppy videos. Mm-hmm. So if you're into the pup dates, go check that out. We are also on Twitter at mm, Murder News. Mm. We are on <laughs> TikTok at Murder Murder News. And um, we just had a great video on Jeffrey Dahmer. Oh, uh, the murder his of Jeffrey Dahmer. Murder. Yeah, yeah. So that's interesting because um, I shockingly actually did not know that he was murdered while he was in prison. I just assume he 
you know, was executed or had passed, you know, like some of the older timey serial killers from the 80s, like I just wasn't sure. So he um, actually was murdered. So we cover his murder and a little bit about his victims in that video too mm -hmm. on TikTok. So go check that out. You can also find us on Facebook, our page where you can just look us up under Murder Murder News. And when you search Facebook for Murder Murder News, our group will also pop up. So you'll want to join that group to talk murder with your favorite podcast hosts and also to stay in the loop about any upcoming virtual events and book club selections. We just had a book club meeting last weekend about I Know What You Did Last Summer by Lois Duncan. And we're about to pick our next selection. So if you want to join us, make sure you're in that group so that you can cast your vote for the books that you think we should be reading. We meet on Zoom on the last Sunday of every month. It's very low key and we're always glad to see new faces. So if you've been thinking about it, please do join us. And also we would really appreciate it if you are enjoying our podcast, if you could leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcast. It really helps us get discovered and gets the word out there. Plus it just makes us feel really good, y'all. Yeah. We're having a crummy week. If you haven't left us one yet. You need a little love. <laughs> God, I could use a pick me up. <laughs> Please and thank you. So we love leave you us back. a little love note. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. We'll we'll read your wonderful review on air. We'll give you some love back. Mm -hmm. So please leave us a review. It only takes the middle of your time and it means so much to mm -hmm. us. And uh, thanks again for joining us. Have a fabulous week and we'll see you here next Friday. Bye, friends. Bye, friends. Murder, murder.